of Abraham, you're the God of covenants and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness.
Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here tonight. Thanks for joining us, both here in the building and on live stream. I'm just excited tonight to worship with you, um, and especially excited tonight um, as Amanda will be preaching. So it's a, uh, um, an exciting night for us to be here together, both in the house of God and on uh, live stream together. So if you would, um, bow your heads with me, and we will begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us first so that we could love you. Thank you that had you not loved us, we would have no hope. We would have no joy. We'd have no peace. And most of all, we would not even know what love is. Father, tonight as we gather in your house, as we gather in your presence, as we gather around your goodness, remind us of the truth that this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Thank you that we did not make our way to you, but you have come to us. And so tonight, God, may we bask in your goodness. May we sit in your presence. May we rest in your love. May we be convinced and confident that you do not waver, you do not stumble, and you do not change. And so thank you tonight that the God who sent his son has chosen to stay near us. Thank you for your spirit who dwells within us. Thank you for your word which goes before us. Thank you for loving us. God, tonight I just pray that we would love you. That we would love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. That beyond trying to understand you, that we would just love you and surrender to you and submit to you and yield fully to this truth. The Lord is good and his love endures so tonight, God, search us and know us. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See, God, if there's any wicked way in any one of us and lead us in the way of everlasting. I love you, Jesus, and I thank you for first loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, have your Bibles with you, have your Bibles near you. We'll close worship tonight with a reading from Luke chapter 1. God bless you guys. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Give him thanks. 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 Hallelujah. 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 chapter 1, starting in verse 26. If you have it open, just follow along, but just listen. Now in the sixth month, 
The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I, did, I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing yes. will be impossible. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Yes, amen. And the angel departed from her. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Yes. Thank you, God. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Yes. Barren women conceive, yes. and virgin, a virgin is overshadowed by the yes. power of the Most yes. High God yes. to bear the Son of the only living God. For nothing, nothing with God Yes. will be impossible. Hallelujah. And so tonight as we prepare to pray, nothing is impossible yes. with God. Yes. Because of Jesus. Yes. Because of the incarnation. Because God became a man. Because God became an embryo. Because God entered the womb of a woman. Nothing is impossible with God. Because Mary was filled in her womb by the Son of God. You and I are filled in our spirits by the Spirit of God. Because as impossible as it was for Mary to conceive, is it, it is as impossible to believe that we could be filled with the Spirit of God. And yet here we are. And yet here we are. Rivers of living water burst forth in our soul. For with God, nothing is impossible. And so tonight, whatever version you, version you may be reading from, whatever version you may have memorized, tonight as we prepare to pray, can we just respond to God the way Mary did? Yes. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Heavenly Father, tonight let it be to me according to your word. Yes. Let it be to us. Let it be to my friends that are watching and my friends that stand around me according to the word of the Lord. Father, tonight we will not rest in what we don't understand, what we see, what we feel, or what we want. We will not be swayed to believe that the impossible has perished. But instead, we will believe tonight that with God, nothing is impossible. That with God, God comes near to sinners. And with God, those who were once filled with condemnation have been filled with the living Spirit of God. Those who were far off have come near. Those who were the rebe rebels have become the children of God. Tonight, God, search us and know our hearts and reveal, shine a bright light on every unbelieving place, on every doubtful place, on every fearful place, on every anxious place. And may we stand in your presence, in your house, among your people, and may we declare for ourselves, let it be to me, yes. according to the word of the Lord. Father, let nothing else rise against your word. Let no witness of man, let no past experience, let no future fear stand against the witness of your word tonight. And so tonight, God, I thank you that the incarnation changed everything so that I can believe that everything can change. Amen. And 
So in your presence tonight, assure us yet again that nothing is impossible for you. Assure us again that you can change everything again. In just a moment, you can fill us yet again. You can surround us yet again. You can touch us yet again. You can lead us yet again. And so wherever we happen to be and whatever we find ourselves in, may we give you complete access. Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me. Let it be to me. Yes, According to your word. Father, tonight, may we take all of the restrictions off. Yes, God. May we tear down every fear and doubt, every shame that has kept us in those old places. Yes, God. And may we be released to something brand new. May we turn the page, may we close the book, and may we move on to the next place, the next thing that you have desired and desired. Fill us afresh and fill us anew with the faith to believe. Yes. That with God, nothing is impossible. And the only, the only limitation that God has is his own word. And so tonight, if he has spoken it, he will do it. If he has started it, he will complete it. Yes, he will. Because he, he is the amen to all of his promises. Yes, thank you. He is the yes to his very word. And he will do what he has decided to do. And so tonight, God, like Mary, we yield. And we say it may be impossible for us to understand, but it is easy for you to accomplish. Yes. And so, God, do what we thought was impossible and show us how easy it is for you to do abundantly more than we have ever asked or imagined. Thank you for sending your son that we might become your sons and your daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And you guys can be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amanda, which stand do you want? This one? So thank you for being with us tonight. Those of you who are here uh, in, in person, thank you for coming out. And um, for those that are watching via the live stream, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, it has been a, uh, it's been a busy day. It's been a, a good day. And just um, so grateful for all that God has done. For the men that were a part of the men's Bible study this morning, thank you for being there and being a part of it. And then for those that were able to come out to um, the book signing today, thank you um, so much. It, um, it real quickly went from something that I was um, uncomfortable and awkward about to something that was a, a blessing and a joy. Um, I told Melissa when she planned this and she put it all together um, that, you know, my biggest thing with it was I, you know, was expecting like four to eight people somewhere in that range. And, um, and she kept saying there will be a few more than that. And um, me being me, um, I was uh, uncomfortable with the whole idea. Um, but we ended up, uh, she made me order more books um, because I thought what we had was plenty. And she made me order more. And I thought um, I was going to be able to show her, you know, see, we didn't need all these books. And uh, it turned out we sold every book that we had and then some. In fact, we had to sell books that we'd already given away in the past. People gave them back so that we could sell them to people who came. So thank you for all of you. Um, for those that may not have gotten one yet and you want one, we'll order more. Um, but thank you so much for your kindness and your generosity toward us. Um, toward me especially, so I'm just really grateful tonight. Um, a few announcements for you. Um, if you haven't gotten a copy of Connected, please get one before you leave um, from the foyer there. Um, Monday night is our next prayer meeting. That's at 7 o'clock on Zoom. If you, need to, uh, if, if you haven't been a part of it before, we just need your email address, and we'll send you the link during the day. Wednesday night is our next Revelation discussion. Um, we'll be talking about Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. That, again, is on Zoom, so we taught about it this past week, and we'll talk about it um, this Wednesday night, again, on Zoom at 7 o'clock. 
And then this Friday night is um, a, a women's meeting, a combined effort between Grace Alliance and City of Refuge, which I'm really excited about. Um, Melissa and Rachel and Veronica and some other women from Grace have worked really hard in putting this together. Um, it's called Joy for the Season, and that will be both here in person and available on Zoom for those who can't be in person. That's at 6 o'clock on uh, Friday night. If you need information, see Melissa about it. There is a link in the Connected um, to sign up at, uh, at Grace's website. So please don't leave tonight without getting the information that you need for that. And then finally, you may be see, have seen on our Instagram and Facebook accounts that this Christmas, with it being a bit different and um, a little bit harder to do the things that we're used to doing, um, we still want to be a blessing to our community. And so we and Grace has joined in, uh, in this with us. We have adopted eight families from Burlington City. And what we want to do for those families is just give them a blessing for Christmas, provide them with Christmas meal, with food, with gifts, um, and even with some things to lead them past Christmas. And so if you are willing or would like to be a part of that, please see Melissa or Amanda for information, or you can go to Facebook and Instagram as all of the information of what we need and what we're gathering is there. Um, you know, with the COVID restrictions, there are a few things we have to do differently, certain things you can have, certain things you can't have. And so before you go buy anything, before you jump in at all, talk to Melissa, talk to Amanda, and make sure that we're all on the same page. But it is a huge blessing to be able to bless eight families in our community um, this holiday. So those are all of the announcements that I am going to share with you tonight. Please grab a copy of Connected before you leave so that you know everything that is going on. So as we've been announcing, as I've been sharing with you tonight, Amanda is going to be preaching, which I am really excited about. It has been far too long since she has had the opportunity to preach to the whole group of us. Um, she preaches at youth group week after week, or I guess every other week after every other week at this point. Um, but she actually hasn't preached since her ordination last year, which because of COVID and schedules and things, it's been much too long. And so those of you who hear her regularly know that God is going to speak. Um, that she seeks him, she hears him, and then she lets him speak through her. So would you please just welcome Amanda as she comes. Got to turn so many things on, take things off. All right. There we go. We are all set up now. So it is a, a joy to be able to, to be here with you guys and not just be behind the camera like I've been doing, but to be able to be up here preaching with you guys. And so this, tonight I just want us to focus on Matthew 5. We're going to read verses 13 through 16. So again, Matthew 5 verses 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hid hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So we love talking about being the salt and being the light, but tonight I want us to dig a little bit deeper and to really look at what it means for us and what it means for the world around us. Growing up, I was not much of a risk taker. I liked to play it safe. I liked to not rock to the boat to the point where what I considered risky, other people probably considered normal. I was the kid that did not just avoid talking to strangers, but was also afraid to talk to people I knew. I, in first grade, I had to call my mom every single day during lunch, even though I could see my house from school, but I just needed that reassurance, that comfort, 
because I was just stuck in this spot of staying in my comfort zone. Sorry, this thing does not want to stay on my ear. My ear is too small. You guys, all right. So I know those are silly childhood examples, but the reality is, is that idea of staying in the comfort zone, staying with where I was comfortable, was something that really stuck with me even into my adulthood. And I'm sure if we are all honest, there are all times when we find ourselves wanting to play it safe. We pursue comfort, we spend ourselves to get more stuff, and we prefer to be entertained. We are tempted by the idea of security. The thought of living a cozy, easy Christian life that does not require anything of us. We are content with knowing that we will not go to hell, but what about those around us? Our friends, families, and even strangers. What kind of life are we really living? Being the salt and being the light each have their own purpose, but both require us to be risk takers, to be those who say yes to Jesus, to be those who put our trust in him. Jesus took a risk. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still so that those who believed in him for salvation would be saved whilst knowing that there would be those that rejected him and that it would not just cost him his human life, but that he would be giving up his place with his father to come to earth as a man. He was still 100% God while he was 100% man. But he put that aside because of love. First, for the love that he had for his father, which then led to the love that he has for us. So God is asking us to take that same risk, to meet people in their painful messes and lead them to the cross, risking rejection, but hoping to be a witness of their salvation. From a worldly perspective, it may be very costly at times, it may make us uncomfortable. There may even be things that he leads us to do and say that we just don't want to do. But glorifying Christ and the salvation of others is far greater than anything we could ever keep for ourselves. We do this by not living for ourselves, but living to glorify Christ and for the redemption of others. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So one of my favorite people of the faith, one of my favorite missionaries is Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a missionary who, along with three other men, was killed for going to a people group that he knew that God had sent him to. And one of his famous quotes is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. For most of us, we may never be called to give our literal lives, to die for Christ. But I don't think it's a matter of us saying, yes, I would be willing to die for Jesus, because in all honesty, we probably do not know what our response would be until we are faced with that very moment. Because I don't believe that Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and the two others that were with them said, you know what? Yes, we are going to die serving these people. They probably, in fact, saw that one day we would be rejoicing together, that we would be praying together with these people. But rather, it is how we live our lives every single day. Are we holding on to Christ, or are we holding on to that which will one day fade away? Have we truly surrendered our lives to Christ as we are right now? Steve Saint was the son of one of the missionaries, Nate Saint, who was killed, like I said, along with Jim Elliott. 
And he said that no one took my father's life, he gave it. And he gave it long before that day on the beach when these men lost their lives. Because these two men and their two others that were with them, they died preaching the gospel. They died pursuing a group of people that had not even heard the word of God before. They were a group of people that were very much, their lives were, were surrounded around murder. They would go into battles with other tribes. They would com- compete with each other. This group of people did not know what it was to have a grandfather because none of the men in that tribe ever lived long enough to be grandfathers. But this tribe was saved because of what Jim Elliott and those other men did. This tribe now has grandfathers because Jim Elliott and the others went to the beach that day. Because you see, their family, after they died, their family then continued the mission. And so while we may not say that, oh yeah, that's what we want to do, that's what we're willing to do, again, these men gave their lives long before that day on the beach. This was how they lived their lives every single day. And this is the life that we are called to live also. A life that is willing to know there is a cost, because after all, Henry Blackaby, who you hear us talk about often, says that obedience is costly to you and those around you. And so we know there's a cost, but we're willing to say that the reward, the glorification of Christ, and the salvation of others is worth the risk. And so we do this by being the salt and the light. We need to be both, and it starts by being fully surrendered to Christ and committed to living like him. So first, I want us to take a look at what it means to be the salt. We read that you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer for good, good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So we become the salt when we trade our comfort for God's will. And when we surrender all to him and live to display his worth. Practically, salt causes change. It enhances or it adds flavor to our food. It helps us melt ice in the winter. It stops decay and it even kills germs. And so we may not think much of salt sometimes. And maybe some of us maybe even try to avoid it in our diets, but in biblical times, salt was essential. It was even a form of currency, because remember, they lacked refrigeration, and so preserving their food was something that they needed to do. And actually, the word salary comes from a Latin word which has the root of sal, which means salt. And so in ancient Rome, it specifically meant the sum of money allotted to a Roman soldier to purchase salt, which was expensive but essential to life. And so for us, when we hear salt, we may not think much of it, but I really want you guys to just think about what it meant to them in biblical times. Salt causes change. Salt makes a difference. And we are meant to be different. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So being different must start in our minds and our hearts. We must allow God to do the work of shaping our character to be like his. And remember, He only reveals what he desires to heal. So if he is showing you parts of your heart that make you uncomfortable, be uncomfortable. It is not to cause you shame or guilt, but rather it is God's love for you, and it is him showing you the places where he desires you to be more like him, where he desires you to walk in his character, where he desires you to be whole. Because God loves us and God desires to restore us. And as our minds are renewed and as our hearts are renewed, that is when our actions will follow. Distinction is always required in order to make a difference. 
We must be different than the world around us. We need to be different than those whom we are called to. Jesus did not fit in with any group. He caused change wherever and everywhere that he went. Abraham was different. He left his family's land and everything he knew to go to a land that God would show him. Not only was he leaving a comfortable place, but he also had no idea where he was going when he took that first step out of his father's land. Who does that? But if Jesus does not come and live differently, then we have no way of getting to the father ourselves. If Abraham does not leave, then he does not become the father of many nations. Genesis 17, 3 through 8 says, Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God which is a beautiful promise. But it has to start with Abraham being willing to be uncomfortable, with being willing to take a step in the unknown, with being willing to take a risk for the kingdom of God and even just the generations that would follow him. We get so caught up in the details. We get caught up in the hows and the whys and the whens. But that is simply not in our hands. So we need to stop trying to hold on to and to gain control of what God has already told us is in his hands and he is taking care of. Jim Elliott says, rest in this. It is his business to lead, command, impel, send, call. It is your business to obey, follow, move, and respond. So we are the salt. We are different by being obedient to what God says and trusting him with the rest. There are going to be times when we look foolish to others. When people question our decisions, when people question our steps. And honestly, I'm going to be honest with you, there's going to be times when even brothers and sisters in the faith are going to question what we're doing and are going to think what we're doing is foolish. But when God speaks to your heart, that is between you and God and no one else. And so God may not speak Ed's promise to Tom, but that doesn't mean that Ed doesn't have to take that step still because that is between Ed and God. We get so, again, so caught up in wanting to have the whole plan and wanting to not know the plan just for ourselves, but wanting to know the whole plan for our loved ones, for our friends, but rather God is saying, I hold you and I hold them. So trust me with your life and trust me with the lives of those around you. Because I promise you, if you move forward and are willing to be a risk taker, you will see God work in and through you in ways you could have never planned or imagined for yourself. But we also read that if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So how does salt lose its saltiness? Salt does not get worn out, but it does need to be kept pure. It loses flavor when it gets contaminated by being stored with something else. As long as, as long as it is being used, it is not being contaminated. A little more context for you with, with this whole verse here is, in biblical times, contaminated salt was used to pave the roads, so it literally would be thrown out and trampled on. 
Again, that's something that we may not think much of it. We may see it as a metaphor, but that is literally that those who Jesus was speaking to would understand what he was saying. It's only good to be walked on. We get contaminated when we allow the world to be what guides us. We get contaminated when we allow our emotions to have control of our actions. We get contaminated when we push God away. We get contaminated when we allow sin, not just into our public lives, but also when we allow sin into our private places, such as in our home, in our relationship, even what we allow to entertain our minds and the thoughts that we give room to. In Luke 14, 34 through 35, we read more about salt. It says, salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. This was said in the context of obedient discipleship to Christ. So the loss of saltiness occurs in our failure to daily take up the cross and follow Christ wholeheartedly. So we must not settle or compromise for that which we find momentary comfort or momentary convenience. And there is one more thing that I want to talk about with salt, which will lead us to briefly talk about being the light. As we have said many times, salt causes change. Another one of those changes is salt will make you thirsty. If you've ever eaten something that's really salty, maybe you've been at the beach and you've gotten a mouthful of ocean water, you need a drink. So if we are the salt and salt causes thirst, are we making those around us thirsty for Christ? Jesus refers to himself as the living water. In John 4, 10 through 14, Jesus says, Jesus answered her, speaking to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And then later in John 7, verses 37 through 39, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we are meant to lead others to Christ. We are meant to make those around us thirsty, that they get drawn to Jesus, who can be the one that quenches their thirst. We make them thirsty by the way that we live our lives. Again, another Jamelia quote. I told you guys he is definitely one of my favorite. But he says, Father, make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on a single road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another when facing Christ in me. So are we bringing people to a decision point? Are we living a way that causes people to have to look at their own lives and look at our lives and see that something is different? They respond differently to difficult, difficult situations. They respond differently when faced with the unthinkable. Are we causing people to be thirsty? Continuing in our passage, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify Father in heaven. So salt causes change, because light 
is coming to bring revelation. Salt affects change and light reveals truth, which we know that truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. And our calling is to reveal the truth by making Jesus known. The true purpose of light is to reveal, not expose. The exposure of sin without the revelation says, look at what you have become, and that brings death. Because fear is only a temporary motivator. The fear of death, the fear of going to hell does not change anybody. It does not save souls. And we are not called to be exposers. We are called to be those that reveal Jesus. And in doing so, Jesus reveals sin in a way that brings hope. Because remember, Jesus only reveals what he desires to heal. That work is in his hand. We are called to be lights, not shining our own light, but to be reflections of him. Just like the moon is only bright because it reflects the light given from the sun. The light is about being faithful, about wanting Jesus, about being in relationship with him and letting him have his way. And being the light, it sounds awesome. It's like, yes, I get to be this bright spot in a dark place. And so we talk about that a lot. We talk about how you can see a light for miles in the darkness. But it is not easy. It is not without risk. Think about it for a moment from the perspective of that light. You might be seen for miles, but if you are the one that's holding a flashlight or any kind of light in the darkness, you can only see what is in front of you. You cannot see the full path. You do not know what is out in the darkness. And sometimes it can even be scary. Sometimes we may even want to turn off the light. Have you ever been outside at night and you think you hear something? And in that moment, you know, you could live in Burlington. And in that moment, you hear something and you think it's like a bear or a lion, something that it's not even possible. But that's, that rustling in the bushes scares you. And you turn off the light, so now this bear, this lion can't get you. Or maybe when you were younger, you were up late, and you knew that you were supposed to be asleep, but you had a light on, and you hear your mom, you hear your dad coming up the stairs. You turn your light off, so that way they, know that you're, they don't know that you're in there. But we can't do that. Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5 says, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Moses was caught up in what he thought that he was missing. Moses was wrapped up in his own emotions, in his own fears, in his own perceived lack. He knew what God had said, but he did not believe he had what he needed to accomplish the task. So he knew that God was great enough to speak to him and to give him this assignment, but yet he doubted whether God was great enough to give him what he needed to accomplish the task. But God asked him, what is in your hand? And then God did the miraculous. He turned his staff into a snake, and in doing so, God was telling Moses that it was he who commanded Moses to go, and he has provided everything Moses needed to do what he had said. So do we trust God enough to be surrounded by darkness? Do we believe that he will be our provider and our protector? Being a light in darkness is hard. It can be scary. But do not lose heart for Christ has overcome the world. And he will put in your hands exactly what you need for such a time as this. 
Remember, it is his business to lead, command, impel, send, and call. And it is our business to obey, follow, move, and respond. Last week, A.B. spoke about the disciples at the empty tomb. And he spoke about how John got to the tomb first, but he did not go in. And we don't really know why, but A.B. spoke about how sometimes in our own lives, fear keeps us from going in. Fear keeps us from going forward. But then came Peter, who went right in, and then John followed. And he asked us last week, what if others are waiting for us to take the first step of faith? Being the salt and being the light is very much being willing to take the first step, to be a risk taker, to be one that causes change, to be one that reveals truth so that others can follow. Trust that Christ is working even when you do not see it. Because remember, a light can be seen for miles. And you may not see all who are watching you, but know that you have the ability to affect so many lives, even change generations. Trust the one who leads you, the one who will not let you go. Like I said in the beginning, in my childhood, I was not a risk taker. But these last 10 years especially, I have come to love taking risks. They are not without their fears, and I am still working on not allowing anxiety to be my go-to response. But I've just noticed that when I am willing to do this, God does amazing things. When I'm willing to go to a land, I will show you moments in my life when I only knew the first step, and I knew the promise, but I didn't know the in-between. These risks have caused me to leave my comfort zone, these risks have caused me to leave my family. These risks have caused me to leave jobs. But I would not be in Burlington if it were not for a risk. I would not be a youth pastor if it were not for a risk. I would not be working in the school district or for the city of Burlington if it were not for risk. Risk have led to opportunities that should have been impossible. Opportunities that never even crossed my mind. Risk have led to opportunities for Christ to be glorified and the salvation of others, and I would not take back any of these decisions. Each tear, each difficulty, each perceived loss has all led to far more gain in the kingdom than I could have ever imagined for myself. So be salty. Make others thirsty. Be the light. Reveal the truth. And in doing so, Christ will be glorified and men will be redeemed. And if you're listening tonight and you have not yet made a decision to fully surrender to Christ, just know that Christ has not given up on you. He is pursuing you. He loves you. He knows the number of hairs on your head and has caught every single one of your tears in a bottle. He wants to have a relationship with you that is real and personal. He wants to work in and through your life. And so as we close out in prayer, if you feel that tonight is the night that you want to make that decision, just please come see me, come see A.B., come see anyone afterwards. We would love to pray with you, to pray for you. And if you're watching online, just send us a message, leave a comment so we can also be praying with and for you. So let's pray. God, I just thank you tonight for being the one that leads us. I thank you that you desire to speak to us. God, I thank you that you do not need us to be a part of your plan, but rather you desire us to be a part of your plan. So God, I just pray that we would be willing to fully surrender our lives to you that we would be willing to be the salt and the light. And God, I just pray that you would just search our hearts, even as we sit here right now, search my heart, reveal the places where we have yet to allow you to make our hearts like you, the places where we are still 
walking in our own ways, where we are still walking in the ways of the world. God, I just pray that we would all desire to make those around us thirsty, that we would desire to reveal the truth, that we would desire to see you glorified in and through our lives, and that we would desire to see salvation, not just in our family, not just among our friends, but God, I pray that we would desire to see salvation in people that we may never meet, in people in other parts of the world, people in our communities, our neighborhood. God, I pray that we would not be those that settle, that we would not be those that compromise, but rather we would be those that are risk takers, that we would be those that pursue you, that we would be those that wake up every single day and say yes to you. So God, I just pray that you would just be with us as we go, that you would continue to stir our hearts and our minds, that you would continue to reveal the places of our hearts that you desire to be healed so that we can be more like you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Stay right here. Turn off the recording. So um, you guys probably noticed we didn't have an intercession time tonight, and that's because we're going to close our time out by praying for Amanda. Um, you know, one of the things I absolutely love about you is you don't just preach what we need to do. You preach what you're already doing. And I am, I am really grateful for that, and I'm very proud of you uh, for that. Not because of what you preach, but because of how you live. And um, you are an encouragement and a uh, challenge um, to all of us in the best <laughs> possible way. Um, but what many of you may not know is when Amanda came to us at City of Refuge nine years ago, she was at Rutgers and she was preparing for a life and for a career as a teacher when God called her into ministry. And when she graduated from uh, Rutgers, I can remember a couple of times sitting with her once at Wilbur Watts and a couple of times at my house when I would say to her, you know, you have your degree, you can teach, um, we can't pay you very much. Um, why don't you try to get a job in the school system? Why don't you substitute teach? Why don't you do any of these particular things? Because I was worried about her needs and also because it just made a lot of sense to me, to be very honest. And every time she would say, it's not what God has said right now, or she was gracious and would say, you know what, I'll pray about it, but I'm just not sure. And I would just tell her, just don't be stubborn. Actually, I say that a lot. Say um, just, say, yeah, that. Just, uh, just don't be stubborn. <laughs> But I learned something in these last nine years through you. And that is there are times when God is showing you something he's going to do in someone's life. But that doesn't mean you know how he's going to do it. And I was abundantly aware that she had her ability to teach and that the best way for her to impact our community was through the schools. And sometimes would just pray and say, God, just get her to go do what she needs to do. And every time she would say, God's speaking this or God's speaking that. And she would go to work at Chick-fil-A and then God would say, no more time at Chick-fil-A. And she would do this. And then slowly, here's what we've watched happen. She um, volunteered to lead a photography club. She volunteered at the high school to do a job readiness thing. Um, she then volunteered to take pictures for the, school, uh, for, the, for the sports teams at the school. And then over this last year, the schools came to her. Would you take pictures for all of our things? Would you consider a part-time job in the cafeteria? And then when pandemic started, the city came and the, and the police came and said, would you work for us? Would you work with us? And then suddenly out of nowhere, the school system comes and says, would you like a full-time job? See, I kept asking her to pursue something that God was pursuing for her. And because she let God do the pursuing, do you know she's never had an interview for a job she's taken? She is, forgive me, she's 30 years old, and she has had more than a couple jobs because she is a diligent person, and she's never had a job interview. Because every time it was time for her to be somewhere, God opened the door for her. Because every time it was time to go, she waited for God to leave. And what a lot of you don't know is this has been a big few weeks and a big few months for Amanda that sort of I don't want to say are culminating today but a lot of things are converging today and sorry to publicly do this to you um, Amanda's parents moved to Florida about less than a week ago she and her grandmother Ms. Mackey are the only two left in New Jersey 
Um, hi, Ms. Mackey, as I know you're watching. Um, Amanda today moves out of the house she's lived in for the last six years. Um, not because she's going anywhere, but because God started speaking to her about buying a house. And see, he spoke about buying a house, and then he opened the door to provide the job that would pay for the house. Because what he spoke to her about the house is it's a place of refuge, a place for souls to be saved, for children to be, find places of safety. And so tonight she preaches, and she goes to a brand new place to live on her way home. But he ordered every single thing, and he will continue to order every single step. And so tonight, Amanda has not preached to us what we need to be doing. He, she's preached to us what God is doing. And as I look around, some of you I can say the same things about. I've watched you take steps of faith. I see some of you are in the in-between of the steps where you left your home, but you haven't got to the promised land yet. Just keep walking. You will get where he says you will go. But you also can't get where he says he will take you until you leave where you've been. Take steps of faith. And watch God slowly but fully fulfill all of his promises. So tonight, would you guys all stand, those that are able, and would you just reach your hands toward Amanda? And let's just pray tonight, not for God to do anything, because he's going to do everything he said he was going to do. But for God to strengthen her and surround her and just uphold her while she watches him do immeasurably more than she's ever asked or ever imagined. And for those of you who have been a part of this, he is going to bless you for your part a hundredfold. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for Amanda. I thank you, God, that we could put her name in with Abraham's and Moses and all of the others that have gone to lands they didn't know, that have taken steps of faith that were uncomfortable. Thank you that she has done it. There are times like Moses, she's done it not believing she could. There's times like Abraham, she's done it not thinking it would really happen, but she's done it. She's done it with tears, but she's done it with faith. And so, God, I just pray tonight that you would surround Amanda with songs of deliverance. I pray that you would reward her with every desire of her heart because she has made you the desire of her heart. I pray, God, that those things that are still waiting, that she would know that they're not waiting for her and she's not waiting for them. You are doing them in the plan and the time that you had planned. And so tonight, God, I thank you that every step Amanda's taken, has you have done what you said you would do. And I pray tonight that she would know that these next steps, that you have a house that you will prepare at just the right time, that you will prepare the right loan and the right loan people and the right everything, because it's what you've always done. God, I thank you tonight for, I thank you for Paul and Barb. I thank you for Joanne and Tom. I thank you for Doug and Jill. I, I thank you, God, for everyone. And there's so many. And forgive me for those I didn't mention by name. But I thank you for everyone that willingly sows because they see there's a harvest coming. And so, Lord, I just pray tonight that Amanda would lay down in a new place, knowing that she's held by the same hands. That she would go into a new season knowing that it's been ordered by the same one that ordered the last season. And I pray that she would know that the one who closes this door is opening the next one, that it is not her effort, it is not even her righteousness, it is your goodness. It is your goodness. And we agree with your word. You do all things well. And so bless Amanda. Keep her. Make your face shine upon her. Lift your countenance upon her. Give her peace and be gracious to her. But may she close her eyes tonight, calling herself blessed. Because you, you have become her blessing. Thank you for Amanda. Thank you for what you've done in her and what you are doing through her. But more than anything, Thank you that she is the salt and she is the light and you are being glorified and men have been, are being, and will be redeemed. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So thank you those who are watching. Amanda has to go turn it off so I'll give, you a, I'll give her a minute to get back there. Um, because she wears many hats. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you for your faithfulness. I pray 
that what you've heard tonight will find a deep place in you. And that we would stop being a people that ever talk about what's impossible. And start being a people who just say to all of our difficulties, nothing is impossible with God. The birth of Jesus is the promise that there is no more limits. That if the king can come, then we can be whatever the king desires. God bless you. Have a great night.